this is our supplemental training to the Law Help Interactive online training series that you've been attending for the last um, several weeks. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about why use A to J Author 5.0. If you're new to the development community, you may not know, but we had version 4.0, which is what is live on Law Help Interactive right now, and we're currently in the process of transitioning to 5.0. We'll talk a little bit about training resources, conditions, advanced logic, functions, and then we'll have time for questions. But we do have a training next week also on supplemental A to J things as well. And we'll talk about repeat loops and exiting um, next week. So let's get started. Why use A to J Author 5.0? As I said, we're transitioning and 5.0 going forward is going to be our current technology that will have the full A to J Author team support. If you're on the listservs, the Doc Assembly or the LS Tech listservs, you may have seen that Flash pushed an update about two or three weeks ago that took down A to J Author 4.0 and a bunch of other software tools that were relying on a specific version of Flash. 5.0 doesn't have that issue because it's cloud-based. So our development team is working closely with LHI to get it up and we expect it to be live on the LHI server for uh, general community use by the end of the year, if not very early 2016. It also has mobile capabilities that 4.0 didn't have. So 4.0, like I said, was built in Flash, and that doesn't work on smartphones, particularly Apple products. And new 5.0 work with has a mobile viewer that allows end users to consume A to J guided interviews from any device with a smart browser. So any smartphones with internet browsers, any kind of computer can use it. It's not restricted the same way that our old version was. It also, because it's in the cloud and isn't Flash-based anymore, authors, you guys, on your end can use any computer that you would like. The old version 4.0 required Windows to be running on um, any machine, including Macs. Version 4.0, if you're looking to get your projects up and running before the end of the year, is still available at old.adajauthor.org. And Flash just last week pushed another update which fixed, which, with, which had a patch that fixed what they broke um, with the ver Flash version 19. So the version 4.0 is working and you can find it at old.adajauthor.org. So let's talk a little bit about what training resources we have. So we've gone through the online training. You were introduced to A to J Author for just a little bit during that third week. And now you're trying to make an A to J guided interview. So what training resources do we have for you? We have a specific page just for new authors on adajauthor.org, which is our community website. To access it, you need to have an account. So if you look in the top right corner here, I'm logged in. And this area right here in the middle, it says new authors. This is where you want to go for all of the training resources I'm going to talk about. If you haven't already created an account on A to J Author, it's a little bit of a two-step process. So you create the account and then Webmaster sends you an email making sure you're not a spam bot and you have to click the link in that email and then you will be activated as an author on our website. But to get access to the A to J Author authoring tool, you need to fill out a survey that we will then send you. So if you don't fill out a survey, which is a Google form, then you don't have access yet to the actual authoring tool. If you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me after this presentation. So if you go to the main homepage and you click the new author section, it takes you to a page that's been specifically created for you. We have new authoring resources, including our authoring guide, which I'll talk about in a minute our sample exercise file, which I'll also talk about. I've pulled out some videos that I think are most helpful when you're just beginning to learn A to J Author, including the basics, how A to J Author and Hot Docs work together, a video on plain language, and then simple and conditional branching, which is how, you, how the end user gets around an A to J Author. I also have a link to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash A to J Author. And then we have a link to register for our monthly new user webinar. The first Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. Central, 
we have a webinar where usually I talk about one specific feature of A to J Author. So if you see the topic, go by on our Twitter feed or on the list. At the beginning of the week, usually Tuesday, I send out an announcement of what the topic will be. And if you're interested in that and want a refresher in that specific area, you can come to our new user trainings. It's also a time for you to talk with me and with our development team or other authors that are in the beginning stages, and we can work through projects together. We also created the how to get started. So basically for you guys, you're here, you have a project, you're, you've learned the software tools, both A to J and Hot Docs, now what do you do? So we've gone through step by step, kind of thinking about the scope, narrowing down your project to manageable chunks, how to make storyboards for mapping out your questions, how to create variables, how to start a document automation project with the hot docs component, and then kind of just a couple other steps on, on how to do things. So if we go back to the slides here, the authoring guide is 190 pages of fun. It has detailed descriptions of every tab, every functionality in A to J Author, tips on how to use the different navigation options, detailed instructions and screenshots for logic, explanations on how to create repeat loops with tons of screenshots and it has several appendices that explain how to do naming conventions and the community standards for drafting and it is a live Google Doc and so it is constantly being updated and added to as we add new features into A to J Author or we fix bugs, that kind of thing. So right now it's 190 pages and it's pretty intensive on everything you would want to know about A to J Author. And I tried to include literally hundreds of screenshots to help walk you through each specific step so that you can compare the authoring guide and your guide interview and work through any problems you have. The two how-to guides that I mentioned so far are how to make a storyboard, which helps you figure out how the flow of your interview is going to work and kind of see the big picture and how things are connected to each other. It's also storyboarding or process mapping are kind of interchangeable terms. And then the how-to guide for starting a document automation project, the Hot Docs component, and it walks you through, you have a piece of paper that you want to automate or a packet, how do you, what's the next step? And so that how-to guide helps you there. We also have our frequently asked questions section and feel free to post questions here to um, our guide, it's the community website or to email me and you will see my email later. But this frequently asked questions section has different things that the community has raised and we answer or you guys can answer each other's question as well. So it's a great place to look when you're trying to figure out something in the software. We also have our YouTube channel. So our YouTube channel has 40 plus videos on how to automate documents. And we have 27 on A to J Author 4.0. We have seven specifically on Hot Docs. So even though Hot Docs isn't in our wheelhouse, we train law students how to use Hot Docs, and so we've put those what, those videos up for you to use as well. And it has Hot Docs Basics and Hot Docs Advanced. And we have eight videos specifically on A to J Author 5.0. There's a lot of overlap between 4.0 and 5.0, so that's why there's not as many 5.0 videos, but when things are different, we've made new videos. And then the sample exercise that I mentioned is a great way for you guys to practice what you've learned in class. So one of the problems with learning software and not immediately working on a project is that you start to lose what you've learned. So I made the sample exercise and it includes instructions on how to automate a hot docs template based on a PDF and then how to automate a corresponding A to J guided interview and then testing as well. The whole thing, we've tested it with our law students, takes about an hour to an hour and a half to do both the A to J and the hot docs component with the step-by-step -step instructions. So if you wanted to practice, it would be a great way to do so. And it includes things like check boxes, multiple choice questions, repeat loops in a table, and addendum, uh, attaching addendum as well. So it pretty much covers the basics and a little bit of advanced in both A to J and Hot Docs. And that's available on our new user, our A to J author new users page that I mentioned before. Finally, the last resource for you guys is me. So I'm the front line for troubleshooting issues that you have. Um, we can do go to meetings individually and work through things. You can email me questions. Here is my email and my phone number as well. 
you do have questions about specific things like my A to J isn't working, whenever you send a question, always send me your file as well so that I can look at it. So I always need your .A to J file, and then I can see what's going on um, on our end. So advanced conditions are sig pretty significantly different from 4.0 to 5.0 versions. In 4.0, there are a bunch of buttons that you would click and then type things in and then click other buttons. And in 5.0, we've made it so that it's more of a free typing exercise where you script the condition yourself in an open logic box. There are two sections where you, or there's one section where you create logic. It's on the question design uh, window. But you can either have your logic run before the question is asked or after the end user presses the button. So based on which of these two open text boxes you type your condition into will tell A to J when to evaluate the condition. So how do you script logic now that it's an open text box? You always start with an if and you always end with an end if. Just like you capitalize the first letter of a sentence, uh, first word, and you put a period at the end of the sentence, same thing, you need an if, and an end if always with logic. There are five commands, only five, that you need to learn for A to J author. If, else, end if, set, and go to. That's it. When we first started talking about having open scripting boxes, I was very nervous about it as an attorney and not a programmer first. But once I got a hold of the fact that it is just these five commands, it's very manageable and it's not actually as scary as it might seem. So you have your five commands and you always have to put your variables in brackets. Whenever there is a space, in your variable name, you must have brackets in your logic. Best practices is to always wrap your variable in brackets, even if it isn't, uh, doesn't include spaces. You always put your question destination in quotes, front quotes and back quotes, and you put the values that you're asking A to J to evaluate in quotes as well. And then finally, you always start each command on a new line. So if, and whatever you want to type is on one command, enter, else, whatever you want to type, enter, and if. So you always have that hard return between each command line. So how, do, how would you use logic? You can set variable values. So in the logic that I have on the screen here, I'm telling A to J author that if whatever number the end user has put in for their number of children is greater than one, I want to set this new variable, child or children, TE, to the word children. Else, so if it's less than one or one, set child or children TE to child, and then that end if. So what I did is in A to J, I asked a question that said, how many children do you have? And if they said more than one, later on I want to be able to say something about their children and not have to use the words child slash children. I want it to be specific to their instance. So I'm creating this new variable, child or children, TE, and I'm setting it to either child or children so that I can use that variable in a macro later to call out that value of, other, of either child or children. You can also, and more commonly, use logic for conditional branching. Conditional branching is taking information that has been gathered in the question from the end user and evaluating it to decide where to send the end user next and it directs the end user so that it's specific to their whatever they've told you. So here in this logic example, the end user has entered their date of birth in adult DOB DA, that's the variable that I've asked, what was your birth date? I'm evaluating and using the function age, which we'll talk about in the next section on functions. I'm testing then whether that date converted to a number using the age function is less than 18. If it is, then they are taken to a question here called three does not qualify that would say something like, I'm sorry, you're not old enough to use this form. It's only intended for those who are 18 and older and then exit them out. Else, if they are older than 18, then they move on to the next set of questions, which in this case is two dash notice date. This is important or useful for your end user and kind of a neat trick that you can build into your A to J author guided interview in that you don't have to ask them, you don't have to ask someone if they're older than 18 and then if they are older than 18, ask them what their birth date is. 
So it eliminates one extra question for your end user that's actually going to be able to continue using the form. And it also does the math for them on the back end, converting their date of birth to a year. Conditions are evaluated in the order in which they are listed. So from top to bottom, if one of the conditions is set to move on somewhere else and is true, then A to J isn't even going to evaluate the other conditions. So that's important to note that order matters. And you can add conditions that evaluate, like I said, the data entered by the end user. Here in the top condition, I'm evaluating whether the income that the end user has said is less than or equal to 35,000. If it is, then I'm allowing them to move on and they qualify. In the second middle condition, if their income is between 35000 and 50000 then I'm going to ask them questions, questions about their expenses, because maybe their income's too high to automatically qualify to use my form, but maybe they have a bunch of expenses that would then knock down their income and allow them to qualify. And then finally at the bottom, you can see I'm evaluating whether income is greater than 50000 and if so, they're going to go to that do not qualify question. You can also do it within one, you can do multiple things like a go to and a set within one if. This first condition here is testing if the income is greater than 35000 If so, I want to set this variable income to high TF to true. And I want to take them to that you do not qualify question. So I'm doing two things. One if, two actions, set and go to. Else, still within that same if, so else if their income is less than 35000 I want to set that same variable, income to high TF, to false. And then they would be branched normally. So I don't have to tell them to go somewhere. It would follow whatever next question is set with my destinations in my buttons. And then if also income is between 35,000 or is less than 35,000 and greater than 25,000, I want to go to a secondary question that's going to ask them about their income and their expenses a little bit more. And if. So always an if. Multiple actions can occur. And else and then another set of actions can occur, and always an end if. So it's a little scary at first when you're just typing this in, but once you get the hang of it and you get those five commands down, it's not actually as bad as it may look. So if you are having problems with your logic, if it keeps breaking, we have a couple common logic errors explained what the error messages are. Your logic box will turn red if, you're, um, if your logic is broken, and then it'll, it'll throw up an error message like un unexpected identifier, missing variable, missing page, that kind of thing, and we have these common logic errors on question number one on our a2jauthor.org page. So you can see the URL here. All right, so moving on to functions. Today we're going to cover a couple different functions. We'll talk about what functions are, and then the date, today, age, has answered, ordinal, dollar, and sum, and then a couple reminders about functions as well. So what are functions? Data is collected from the end user and it's stored in variables. You know this. And functions allow you to manipulate that data. Functions are built-in actions performed to alter data collected. And the format, as you can see, is the function name, all in caps, parentheses, bracket, the variable name, close bracket, close parentheses. It's important to wrap your uh, functions in parentheses, and you always wrap your variable name in brackets as well. So where can you use functions? You can use functions in the question text. For example, here I'm using a function to call out what is the name of the first child. So I'm using a function ordinal, and it's pulling from uh, child count, which is a counting variable we'll talk about when we talk about repeat loops, loops next week but it is pulling out the number of times the end user has been through the loop, and then it's turning that into an ordinal. So they've only been through the loop here once. The next time they go through the loop, it would say, what is the name of the second child? What is the name of the tenth child? So each time they go through the loop, that ordinal gets changed, and it's further customizing it for your end user. You can also use conditions in 
or you can also use functions in conditional text. So we already, I've already showed you how you can convert whatever date they've given you to an age and then evaluate that age to do something else. Like here, send uh, someone who is less than 18 to a sorry, you don't qualify question. The first uh, function we'll talk about here is the age. So I've given you the example. The syntax then to remember is age, all in caps, parentheses, bracket, variable name, close bracket, close parentheses. It only works with date variables, so make sure that your variable is actually a date type. On that note, it's important to make sure that your variable types match between A to J author and hot docs. And the way to make sure they match is to import your component file into A to J author. I'm not sure if we talked about this during the A to J basic a couple weeks ago, but you cannot take your A to J variables and import them into hot docs. Uh, hot docs doesn't allow that. However, you can import that .cmp file, your component file, from HotDocs into A to J Author so that you make sure you're working with the exact variables. The next function uh, to talk about is the date function. It converts days into the month, month, day, day, actually year, the four year uh, date. So where would you use it? So you could determine a deadline for an answer that's maybe 30 days from whatever they've told you was the notice date. So you can ask, when did you receive the notice? And then add 30 days and then convert that into a date and tell the end user you must file by X date. Um, instead of just saying you must file within 30 days of your notice, you can give them the specific date that they have to file by. It's a nice way to personalize it further for your end user and make them not have to figure it out themselves. Important to note with this one that when you're, say, for example, adding 30, it's adding 30 calendar days, not 30 um, business days. So if your state determines things like when they have to mail in responses based on business days, this function would not be appropriate. Then we have the today function, which returns today's date. You can determine if a user is within statute of limitations. So here I asked, when did the incident occur? And then in the logic on the back end, I'm testing whether today, the function, minus whatever date the incident date is, is less than 365 days or whatever is required by my statute of limitations. If so, then they're going to move on. Else, so if it's greater than 365 days, I'm going to take them to a different question that'll say something like, sorry, it's been 728 days since the incident and the statute of limitations has run. And again, further lets you uh, customize it for your end user. Then we have the has answered function. Has answered the way I mostly use it or to, uh, teach it is to test for a name, so middle name specifically. Not, um, not every form allows you to have spaces to put first name, middle name, last name. Sometimes it's just one line, and you want to have one variable called client name full TE, um, but you want to, in A to J, you want to combine then first name, middle name, last name, but if they don't have a middle name, you just want first and last name to be combined and not a extra space where middle name would have been. So you test whether or not uh, client name middle has been answered with has answered. If it has been answered, then you set uh, client name full to first name, middle name, last name. Else, you set it to first name and last name. But you can use has answered to test whether any variable has been answered. Um, and it will return a true or false value. So if it is answered, it's basically true. If it has not been answered, it will be false. Using has answered in A to J, in this logic, eliminates the need to have a computation in hot docs to combine that first, middle, and last name. Then we have ordinal. I already showed you ordinal in the beginning example, and it returns the ordinal form of, the num of a number. So first, second, third, 147th anything like that. And it's nice in a repeat loop about, for example, children, to ask what is the name of the first child, what is the name of the second child, fourth child, just remind the user which time through the loop they are. Then we have dollar. Dollar formats a number with the comma and the two numbers after the decimal. So the end user may type 15,000 with no proper punctuation 
And if you then use the dollar function, it will convert it and put uh, the dollar sign, a comma, and the period, and then the two numbers after the period, um, after the decimal, to properly format it. You can see the syntax here. When we get through all of these, I'm going to take you into A to J Author and give you an example of these functions live so you can see how they work. We have sum, oh, sorry, that's an old picture. Um, that's 4.0. Sum returns the total value of all values entered for a repeating va variable. So you may ask the end user about their assets. And they may tell you that they have five assets, and first asset's worth 100, second's worth 200, and so on. And then you can use sum at the end to total up and say, you've told me all of your assets equals whatever. Is this correct? Like you can see in the screenshot. Uh, and it does not require them to do the math either. A couple of reminders about syntax. As I mentioned, you have to wrap your variable with parentheses. And, well, your variables you have to wrap with brackets, and then you have to wrap that in parentheses for specifically for dollar, ordinal, and sum. But it's good practice for all of your functions. Whenever your variable has a space, your variable name has a space, you must wrap that in brackets or it will break. And then to show the value of a variable or a function, to call it out, you use a macro. And we talked about macros in that intro to A to J class. But macros, as a reminder, are percent sign, percent sign, name of the variable, percent sign, percent sign. So for example here, if I wanted to call out the total number held within client total asset value NU, convert that to dollars so that it has the proper formatting, and then call that out, I would um, do as the example is here. All right, so we're going to go into A to J quickly. So I have the functions example. All right, so we'll go into the sample interview into preview. What I have open here, so this is how it would look to your end user um, without this demonstration purposes only language. But when you're testing, it's always a good idea to have your variables or your script window open. So you do that by clicking this button at the bottom that says variable slash script, or you can click on our logo and it will open it up either way. What this does then is show me all my variables and it will automatically update as I add in values. And it also will run the script and I can see what's going on behind the scenes and make sure that my logic is working properly. So let's walk through it and I will show you what I mean. So here we can enter the name. I can choose an avatar. Then my avatar pops up. And here it's testing whether um, I've answered middle name. Because I did not put a middle name, it's setting this variable client name full TE to client first name plus a space and then client last name. And now client full name, this new variable, is just Jessica Frank. And then it would take this in my hot docs um, when, when the end user eventually gets to the end of the guide to interview and it compiles. It would then just have this instead of a weird extra space where middle name would have been if I hadn't tested for this. Now I'm going to enter a birth date. If I pick a date that makes me younger than 18, you can watch on the left here in the scripting box, you'll see what happens. I'm taken to a sorry you don't qualify question because this logic right here was true. That the client date of birth, which was 10-1-2015, that you can see here, converted to an age would make me 19 days old. Um, that is less than 18 years. So it took me to that you don't qualify question. If we go back and put in an age that makes me older than 18, and I hit continue, it reevaluates, and now that condition is false. I'm over 18, so it's moved me on to this next set of questions. You can see the logic right here. All right, so if we put in an incident date, let's again use the first of the month. The incident occurred. And it's testing here again, red, whether the today minus the incident date is greater than 90. Because it's not, because it's only been 19 days, I can move on to the next set of questions. We go back and I change the incident date 
to January 1st, then again I go to that sorry you don't qualify question because it's been greater than 90 days. You don't have to use the same sorry you don't qualify question. You can have multiple sorry you don't qualify for a specific reason question that might be better for your end user. So in the beginning, when if I wasn't old enough to use the form, I should be taken to a customized page that says sorry you don't qualify because you aren't 18 years old or whatever the reason. Here it should have been taken to something that said unfortunately you are required by statute to file blah 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 within 90 days of the incident date, what the date you've told me is more than 90 days so you don't qualify. You might also want to give your end user a way to go back and change their date so maybe they put in the wrong date. So instead of just an exit button here, you have another button that says go back. And we'll talk about um, how to do that in uh, next week's class. All right, so let's go back and change the date and make it within 90 days so we can move on. All right, I received notice. All right, incident of discrimination, we'll change this date. So when did it happen? It's the first, and then what day did you receive notice? Say the fourth. You must file a response by 11 to 2015. So here I used in the question itself, I called out the date, which is the notice date plus 30 days, and then converted that into a date. Here I'm using a macro to call out the name that the that I've told A to J author that my name is. So I'm calling it out and personalizing it. How many assets do we have? Let's say we have two assets. What is your first asset? I'm using that ordinal there. First asset, let's say it's a house. How much is your first asset worth? Let's say $100,000. And you can see over here on the left, that as I'm typing it in, it's updating house $100,000 as well. So um, it's a great way with testing to make sure it's working properly. What is my second asset? Let's say it's a car. How much is my second asset worth? Um, let's say $10,000. Now I've added up for the end user the, their assets, and you can see that in um, the logic. Over here, let me get the highlighter again. So there's logic before the question. So before this question is ever displayed to the end user, I'm setting a variable called client total asset NU to the sum of this repeated one where I was collecting the, val the different asset values of $100,000 and $10,000. And that's totaling that to $110,000. On this specific question then, I'm going to use a macro and the dollar function to go in and um, display that number, which is 110,000 without any proper formatting in the proper format. So if we look at this, you can see that I've used the dollar function to call out that value and properly format it and it comes with the comma and the, two, period, the um, two numbers after the decimal. They can say whether or not this is correct. Since it's um, 100,000 plus 10,000 is 110,000, we're correct here. Now it's asking for monthly expenses. Let's say first, that's using that ordinal again. Um, $500. Second monthly expense, car payment. And that's $100. And again, it's totaling it up and using the dollar um, function the same way that we did with um, the assets. And then they get to the end. And again, it's personalizing it. I'm using that variable macro to call out the end user's name as well. So this is um, the end of what I have for today. And next week, we're going to talk about um, repeat loops and exiting. If you have questions before then, you can feel free to um, email me here with any of your questions or if you have project specific questions. Otherwise, I will see you next week, same time at 11 uh, Central, and we'll talk about um, repeat loops and exiting. And don't forget, so thank you all for attending, and I will see you next week.